The nominees are Baroness, Gojira, Korn, Megadeth, Periphery. And the Grammy goes to Dystopia, Megadeth, yeah! Hey, we're Megadeth, you're not Being one of the greatest metal bands in history, Megadeth has undoubtedly made a huge impact on the world of metal. After the founder of Megadeth, Dave Mustaine, was kicked out of Metallica back in the day, he was able to make his own mark with 16 studio albums stretching back from 1985 all the way until present day. And Dave has been fortunate enough to work with some of the best metal musicians throughout the years. And because of these lineup changes, we get new styles, we get new techniques, we get new aspects of music theory that we get to explore. So now, before we get started into this stuff, I need to explain. Dave Mustaine, being the founder of Megadeth, is also the main writer of Megadeth. Meaning that I would say about 95% of his songs, he wrote them with all of the instruments and all the lyrics. Meaning that all the musicians that you're used to hearing have actually been hired to write the solos, but are actually basically paid studio musicians. So that's really important to understand that Dave did a very large majority of the writing. Now with the guitar solos, for example, that is a little bit up for debate since some of them Dave at least wrote the melodies of, but then a lot of them the guitarists got to add their own flavor to it. So bear that in mind, but I'll note that as we go into this video. But what exactly made Megadeth so special? Well, I'm going to be taking you through every single studio album and going through every single song in their entire discography. Yes, you heard me correctly, every single song. Now, I'm going to be not doing any bonus tracks or anything like that, but going in chronological order from confirming on things like Wikipedia, Spotify, we're gonna basically be diving into the music theory aspects of every single song, and you're gonna get a fantastic understanding as to why Megadeth is so great. But of course, some songs will get a little bit less analysis and some will get a lot more analysis. Because Dave is the main writer, things are gonna repeat. We're gonna do kind of the same music theory aspects over and over again, et cetera, et cetera. But nonetheless, you're gonna learn a ton about music theory in this. Voice the chord upside down and you hear the higher notes first. And obviously it's gonna sound better because you hear the whole chord as I'm gonna explain every single aspect so that way you understand even if you don't have a huge grasp on music theory just yet. So get ready, we're going through all the harmonic, melodic, and rhythmic properties of Megadeth starting in 1985. So the first studio album of Megadeth is titled Killing Is My Business and Business Is Good. This was the first album with guitarist Chris Poland who at the time, he's more of a jazz fusion kind of guitarist. Now in this album, you're gonna see a lot of really cool jazz influence, and I'm really excited to take you through that. So let's start with the first song on the album, titled Last Rites, Loved to Death. Now hearing the song right out of the gate, it's clearly inspired by Bach's Toccata and Fugue in D minor. This is something that is not very surprising, as Dave Mustaine is a huge fan of Michael Shanker, who had a lot of classical influence, and I think that that inspired Dave to pick up on some of that classical stuff as well. But anyways, being that Toccata and Fugue is in D minor, as the title says, this is also starting out in D minor with the piano. Now, we're gonna talk really quick about D harmonic minor because you need to understand what this scale actually is. So the key of D minor has one flat in it, and that is going to be B flat. Boom, right there. Okay, so to make a D minor scale, all we have to do is use the whole step, half step method of the minor scale, okay? Which is gonna be whole half, whole whole, half, whole whole. Now taking a look at this scale, we have D minor. Now to make it harmonic, all we have to do is raise the seventh note, which is C. So instead of C, we're gonna be playing a C sharp. Now, ignoring my sloppy handwriting on this, all we have to know is that the raised leading tone or the raised C sharp is basically going to impact the chords that we use in these kinds of songs that use this scale. And what I mean by that is whenever we have something like a five chord, right? So if we play a five chord in this key right here, 
we would have we'd have to make that C a C sharp, right? So then you'd have an A major chord and that would be called your dominant chord. You can even add a G in there to make it a dominant seven chord and that gives you a lot of tension and resolution. The same thing works with the diminished seven chord, which we would start on the note C sharp and stack it in minor third. So C sharp, E, G, and then a B flat in there. So this was a really neat way to begin the album. It was really interesting to hear a lot of really cool guitar runs and a lot of descending minor scales underneath. It was a really strange way of starting off Megadeth's entire career. And I think that really set them apart from a lot of these other thrash metal bands. Now I've talked a ton about modulation on this channel and you're gonna need to know what modulation is as we go forward and it's gonna start with this song. So after the piano intro, we basically head right into A minor. And basically the riff uses a flat two and an augmented six interval of F sharp. So being that we're in A minor, it's a really easy scale to understand because in the key signature, there are no sharps and there are no flats. So that's really easy. Now, what does the flat two mean? Well, that basically means you go to the second scale degree, which is B and you make it a B flat. This is a really common thing that we do in metal music. Okay. So if we have that flatted two in there, we also need that augmented sixth interval, right? So augmented means raised. Okay. So we're going to go to the sixth and move it up a half step. It almost kind of looks like we're in E minor with a flatted fifth or something like that. But for now, we're going to stick to it, calling it a harmonic minor, just with those accidentals in there when they come up. So there's a lot of chromaticism happening in the song. We get a really solid solo from Dave with some pentatonic scales, some blues scales, and all that good stuff. All the stuff that Dave is notorious for doing, especially in his early days. So as I keep explaining things, the pentatonic scale is just a five note scale. So we're going to take the minor scale, but we're going to get rid of the two and we're going to get rid of the six. Okay. And then the blues scale is the same exact scale, except we're going to add the flatted fifth in there. So being that the solo is on top of an A minor riff and an F sharp minor riff, Dave does a great job of changing the keys, but still keeping the same kind of feel of the solo. It's a really good thing that guitarists can do that is that we can kind of keep the same style, but go into different keys. Now it's kind of similar to what Alexi Laiho did in some of his work with Children of Bodom. If you remember the documentary that I made on that, if you haven't seen it, definitely go check it out. But in his songwriting, using non-diatonic chords and non-diatonic notes when writing riffs and solos especially when changing keys is a really awesome thing that we can do so going on to the second song killing is my business and business is good okay this features the key of c sharp minor okay so now we have four sharps in the key signature which is the relative minor to e major i really like the doubling of the guitar riff with the bass it really emphasizes the melody and the tempo starts at 120 bpm and has tons of 16th notes, okay? Something that thrash is really notorious for. So to write thrash, you really do need a lot of 16th notes. You need that fast paced sort of style with the alternate picking, along with this very simplistic yet energetic style of drumming. So the next song is titled The Skull Beneath the Skin, and this starts off with a diminished seven arpeggio. and it's moving up chromatically, which basically means that we're moving up a fret using the same exact minor third pattern with stacking minor thirds. So one thing we need to talk about is how Megadeth tuned their guitars and their instruments, or rather how the songs ended up coming out in terms of the Hertz level. Basically, the key of this song is in E minor, but it is not exactly to our typical E of 82.41 Hertz. What I want you to think about is the song TNT by ACDC. They kind of do the same thing where they're just slightly off of that 82.41 Hertz. They're just off by maybe about a fourth. And doing this doesn't entirely affect it too, too much. It kind of makes it just harder for us guitarists to learn how to play. So being in the key of E minor, we have one sharp and that is F sharp. So if you can look at the circle of fifths, it's right over at one o'clock, which is the relative minor to G major. OK, and we're going to use the flat two occasionally. So an F natural instead of an F sharp. So the song uses a lot of chromaticism, especially in the guitar solo. Now, Rattlehead is the fourth track, also in the same tuning as in one fourth step below E. Now, the closest key would therefore be.
The guitar solos are pretty insane and Chris Poland basically uses a mix of the Phrygian mode and the third mode of the major scale as well as the blues scale and the harmonic minor scale. Now the fifth track is called Chosen Ones and it's in the same tuning once again a fourth below E standard that we're typically used to. More of the same stuff in this one like the flat two and the solo having a lot of chromaticism and pentatonic scales so you can kind of see the style already emulating. Now the odd part of the song has to be around two minutes where things get really interesting with the chords. So in A minor we have a six to a five and then we have a flatted five chord to a three chord. The flat five or E flat into the C can be thought of as a C minor chord but soon we get back into more chromaticism until we end our dominant seven or E7 chord. Now moving on to looking down the cross. So we hear some industrial sounding stuff in the key of G minor with a really solid bass line. And we hear some guitar shredding until we finally get into the key of A minor. So a little more modulation there. So some really weird chords are happening around the time the vocals come in. And the really weird thing about this song is at the very end, you can actually hear the note A being hit as in an A3, which is normally 220. 20 hertz and it's in the right hertz but everything else is still a fourth step down so i thought that was really weird uh the seventh song titled mechanics is in the key of e minor mostly using the same stuff as the previous songs on the record now e minor has a key signature of one sharp as we said okay and this key is used a lot in metal simply because we have those open strings right there we can use the 12th fret as our marking for our guitar solo shapes it's just overall a really solid key to use sounds dark a lot of times we use our phrygian dominant in that key it's a really good thing to use so the eighth track is pretty different we finally get to hear some of chris poland styles in the beginning with a jazz blues-esque style and that's really cool to hear now the chord progression basically follows while the bass does a cool walking bass line to help drive the song now the song quickly does turn into thrash resulting in kind of Motorhead's Ace of Spades. Now one thing to note when you're trying to find the key to something, especially if you have the key signature in front of you, go to the very last sharp, which right here would be D sharp, and just go up a half step and that's your key. And if you want to know the relative minor, all you have to do is if you find that major, just go back three frets or three half steps. So this one, D sharp being up a half step would be E. Then all you'd have to do is go back three frets and then your minor is C sharp minor. But to summarize, this record sets the bar pretty high for Dave. You know, it features some unusual chords and chord progressions, and it makes use of some classical and jazz inspiration. Now, Megadeth's second and very successful studio album, Peace Sells But Who's Buying, is Chris Pullen's last studio album. So he only lasted for about two records until later, but we have guitarist Jeff Young coming up next. But anyways, with Chris Poland, this record still seems to use the same tuning, okay, so we're slightly below E standard by a fourth, so keep that in mind. Overall, this album seems to be a little lighter than the last record, but this one still has a lot of really good gems, so I'm really excited to take you through all. So the first song, Wake Up Dead, is a pretty moderate song. It has a very moderate tempo and some really dark grooves. So we basically wound up hearing an F sharp Locrian riff, and it's basically gonna be an E minor style chord progression, often going back to F sharp, okay? So let me explain that to you real quick. All I really did was I made an E minor scale, but I'm starting on F sharp, okay? So Locrian is the seventh mode of the major scale or the second mode of the minor scale, okay? So the major scale modes and the minor scale modes can be intertwined. It just depends on where your starting point is, meaning that if you're in the key of E minor, that would be your Aeolian mode. Then the next one in line, F sharp, would be Locrian, okay? So don't get those two confused. So the next section at 240 basically features an E minor staccato riff while Dave takes another cool legato solo with some octave slides and some more altered scales. So if you don't know the difference between legato and staccato, it basically means that legato, we're playing things more fluently, more uh, hammer-on, pull-off, slurry, and then staccato is very blocky and kind of a straightforward dot, 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 dot. I think Dave gets really underappreciated with a lot of his solos because he kind of clearly knows how to add a lot of spice versus the usual pentatonic and natural minor runs, especially for this time. Now, the second song off the album titled The Conjuring holds out chromatic power chords starting on G, while Dave does some really cool harmonic tapping of Hedgeo.
Now, the intro doesn't really have a key center until we get into the verse, which seems to dive around E minor, but used F sharp as a pedal tone. Now, basically what a pedal tone is, is when you make a melody, you can kind of constantly go back to that lick. Bach did this a lot in a lot of his organ works and a lot of his piano pieces. Honestly, tons of composers do it and tons of metal bands do it all the time in their guitar solos. And this is a really good example of using F sharp as their pedal tone. Two minutes and 57 seconds in, we are hearing a nice tritone riff in the key of E minor using B flat and the last run at the end using a diminished scale. Now the diminished scale is very, very simple. All we have to do is constantly switch back from whole steps and half steps. So the third track titled Peace Cells is by far their most successful tune on the record. It has a really angry groove that has a really good hook. Now the song basically stays in E minor using mostly diatonic chords and once again using the Locrian mode in many parts at 217 there's a really cool 1, 3, 2, 5 progression and in general we stay around diatonic chords. So this song is a really good example of how any genre should have a pop element because it creates good hooks and melodies and it overall gives you a really strong meaning with the lyrics. Now the fourth track titled Devil's Island is a really good example of using the flat 5 or the tritone and using E minor we hear a 1 5 and then a flat 5 chord. The tritone is a very simple concept to understand, okay? Basically what we're doing is we're flatting the fifth. So some people call it the diminished fifth and some people call it the augmented fourth. I could have written A sharp and it would have been the exact same thing, okay? So a lot of people have this weird conspiracy that the tritone was banned from the church. Not a thing, actually not a thing. You should watch Adam Neely's video on that, but it's still a really cool and dark sounding interval because we're so used to the typical perfect fifth and dropping it down a half step does make it sound pretty darn dissonant. After that, the vocals come in over a chromatic chord progression ascending from E to G. The song also has a really solid hook using the shouty style of vocals that Thrash is known for. Welcome to how to be a thrash metal vocalist. Slayer, 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 Slayer. And once again, in about two minutes, 30 seconds in, we do have the F sharp Locrian and using F sharp as our pedal tone. So now on the fifth track, we're in A flat minor now, which is pretty interesting. Now using a one and then a one add nine, and then going into a one add 11, simply by changing the bass notes, it's creating different chords. And then at the end, we do get a diminished seven arpeggio. So the cool part of this song is the use of the open high E string in such an odd key. Often we don't really use the open strings in weird keys like this, but this is a good example of knowing your key signature and knowing E natural is the minor six interval of A flat. Chris Poland takes on the cool melodic phrases, but the coolest part of this song is the smooth modulation into E minor. Remember, with modulation, you need to use a pivot note or a pivot chord in order to modulate. And the best thing you can do with that is to use common tones. And what Dave did was he used the open E to modulate into E minor over at measure 30. Now, of course, the tempo increases and the metal begins. So the main riff has a really heavy slip jig sort of feel. So sort of an Irish kind of style song because that is in the time signature of 12 8 instead of 9 8, not to be confused with. And of course, in Thrash, we're typically used to the 4-4, four, four, so it's nice to spice it up with their time sigs a little bit. And anyways, using an E minor arpeggio, but once again, changing up the bass notes, that's a really common thing to do to overall change the chord and the tonality of the riff. And if you're having trouble reading time signatures, basically the top number is how many notes are in a measure, and then the bottom number is the value of that note. So 4-4 four, four is four quarter notes. 3-4 would be three quarter notes. 2-4 would be two quarter notes. This song is super long and takes a lot of strange turns harmonically, like using F sharp Locrian and then eventually G Locrian. So obviously Megadeth is really big fans of the Locrian mode. So the sixth song titled Bad Omen once again has a really cool ethereal sounding chord progression, but in E minor also using the minor nine interval and the flatted fifth. It resembles Metallica's The Call of Cthulhu. Same stuff happening for the rest of the tune and moving on. And real quick, if you don't understand those add-on chords like add 9, add 11, 
A ninth interval is the same thing as a second up an octave. An eleventh is the same thing as a fourth up an octave. So all we're doing is adding that to the triad. It's really nothing that complicated. So the seventh track titled I Ain't Superstitious is a really bluesy style song, and it's honestly a really good palate cleanser, and it's a really nice break from all the heavier stuff that we're used to. So now your dominant seven arpeggio is actually really easy to understand because all we have to do is go to the five, which would be B, and then build a seventh chord off of it. So if you don't know how to build a regular seventh chord, just make a major triad and then slap a minor seventh up on top, okay? And what you should pay attention to is the third scale degree. The D sharp right there is literally the raised seventh in harmonic minor. So they're all intertwined with harmonic minor and dominant seven. So the final song, my last words, is a really cool D minor tune using the flatted fifth and a lot of chord extensions. So in D, we have a D minor seven into a D diminished chord, and then F major into a D minor arpeggio with a chromatic bass line. Now, where does that diminished D minor chord come into play? So diminished arpeggios, they can be stacked in so many different ways, considering the fact that they're all minor third intervals. So if they're all minor third intervals, using a D diminished chord could also be looked at as an A flat diminished chord because the notes don't change, only the position changes. You can then safely resolve to A flat or a natural, the third of F major, which is the next chord in the arpeggio. So we get a lot of Iron Maiden vibes in this song, especially at three minutes and 30 seconds, and we are in D minor, so one flat in the key signature. And so to summarize this record, of course, we have tons of Locrian riffs, the diminished licks, weird altered and non-diatonic chords, and of course, tons of chromaticism. We got to hear a lovely modulation in general, had more keys than the last record, which is exactly what we want for our ears. So the next album, titled So Far So Good, So What, was released in 1988 with a slightly new lineup as Chris Poland was no longer in the band and was replaced by Jeff Young. Young was a guitar teacher prior to joining Megadeth. So the first song on the album, titled Into the Lungs of Hell, is 100% instrumental, which is really nice to hear. It features some of their best guitar work up to this point. So the chord progression basically uses a box shape, which is something that a lot of us guitarists are very much used to playing. So the second song is called Set the World of Fire. After the explosion, we starting in E minor with a whopping 203 BPM, so going super fast here. So the 16th note triplets are reasonably easy to keep up with, but it's more the vocals that we should briefly talk about. This song is a good example of bands starting to explore other aspects. In this case, Dave has this really strange sounding low voice underneath his vocals, which likely was just dropped down in pitch in post-production, but nonetheless, it was nice to hear something a little bit new. And anyways, hearing the solo towards the end is Jeff Young and he uses mostly Phrygian dominant, Yngwie Malmsteen style licks, which would make sense considering around that time in the 80s, Yngwie was pretty big. The song is actually a cover of Sex Pistols' Anarchy of the UK. Being that the original is a punk style song, it was interesting to hear their take on it, and there's nothing really that different other than the production was upped, and it's in the key of C major, so it sounded pretty cool. Fourth tune is titled Mary Jane, and it's a very classical sounding song, so that was really awesome to use. Basically, after we get through all the chromaticism, we're in the key of D minor, hearing a raised leading tone in the main group. So raised leading tone is C sharp, and we get a major sixth interval in the chord progression around the 15th measure, but still has the typical minor sixth interval of B flat later on. This is a really good example of using non-chord tones. This is also how around measure 21 we modulate into E minor by using that B natural and B flat switching as a way to make the listener second guess themselves. Now the next song is called 502. It is in A minor and sounds pretty standard until we get to the augmented sixth interval of F sharp once again, as we've seen before. In My Darkest Hour is another super popular Megadeth song. Being that it's the sixth track on the record, we're in E minor and we get some pretty strange chords in there. We have an E minor seven add nine. We also have a D add 11 over C, and then we have an A over C sharp, and then a repeat with some slight variations on those chord extensions. So you already know what a chord extension is, as in a 9, 11, and a 13 is just a 2, 4, and 6 up an octave stacked with your triad or your seventh chord, and it sounds great. But what are those slash chords? Well, all a slash chord is, is it's telling you exactly what the bass note is going to be. So if it says something like, a minor over C. That means that we're gonna stack A minor up at the top and then we're gonna put C on the bottom. Think of it as something like this. We have our typical A minor triad up top, but then we throw a C on the bottom. It's a really nice way of getting a nice different sort of sounding chord while keeping the same tonality. So the seventh track is titled Liar and it sounds like your standard angry Dave thrash song with some shreddy solos. And the final track titled Hook in Mouth 
is in E minor using mostly diatonic chords aside from the occasional flat two and more chromaticism. So diatonic simply means as is in the key. So no accidentals, no borrowed chords, just your normal standard stuff. Now to summarize this record would be one word, neoclassical, because we had so many things with the obvious dominant seven with the harmonic minor and things like that. And it was really evident that it was a lot of Bach and Schenker inspired. So we finally reached the fourth studio album and that is titled Rust in Peace. Now this is considered Megadeth's best album and it's really for good reason. So this is the first recorded album featuring guitarist Marty Friedman. And this upgrade was pretty surreal at the time, being that Marty Friedman was originally jamming out with Jason Becker back in their solo band. This album definitely has their most notable hits in their entire career. And let's just kind of jump right into it. So the first track is titled Holy War. Dave seemed to be really taking the lyrics and melodies a lot more seriously at this time. And there was a lot more hooks to sing along to. Now the song is in the key of E minor. So we have one sharp again, and we're back to that fantastic 82.41 Hertz. Now the main riff, once again, use some basic box shaped chromatic runs and Dave later takes on a catchy melody using the harmonic minor scale. Now the first measure of the lead actually uses an E minor seven chord or arpeggio. Now an E minor seven arpeggio would basically consist of E, G, B, D, right? We don't really have to add anything to it because a minor seven chord is literally as it sounds. We're making a minor triad and then we're stacking a minor seventh on top, just like this. So the song's got tons and tons of flat fives, okay? And as we remember, that's the same thing as a tritone, so the B flat. We also feature a lot of things like raised leading tones, and Marty uses a nylon guitar and shreds a double harmonic minor scale, which is literally the harmonic minor scale with a raised fourth and a raised seventh. So in the key of E minor, we have an A sharp and a D sharp. So Marty also uses parallel keys, like around three minutes and 27 seconds, we hear a G major to a B flat major arpeggio, borrowing from the parallel minor, G minor. The next song is called Hangar 18. It's in the key of D minor and goes through the chords of D minor, B flat major, B diminished to a D minor seven before getting back into D minor. So most of those chords we already went over, but because I'm so awesome, I'm gonna make sure you guys understand everything I'm talking about in this video. So a minor triad literally uses the formula of a minor third and then a major third stack. So if you take a look here, we have D to F, okay? That is a whole step and then a half step apart. Then we have F to A, and that is two whole steps apart. So that's literally the difference between a minor third and a major third, and you stack it up in that way. Major chords are the exact opposite. So we'd stack major third first, then minor third. That's why if I made this an F sharp, that would become a major chord. Or you can think of it like literally sharping the third can make it major, depending on the key signature, of course. Now, of course, we already talked about the minor seven arpeggio, but we did not really talk too much about the diminished, and I just wanna make sure you understand that as well. So, if we were making a B diminished arpeggio, okay? Let's say we did it right over here. So I'm gonna make this a B natural. We need to keep stacking our minor thirds, dude. So what we gotta do is go from B, go up a minor third or a whole step and then a half step. So that's D. We already did this D to F right here, another minor third, and then F to A flat. And then boom, we have our diminished seven arpeggio and that is pretty much how diminished works. But anyways, the song has a really good groove and overall a solid structure with melodies that make sense. Now, the perfect amount of tension and resolution happens throughout the song and constantly uses the B natural instead of the B flat. That would explain the B diminished arpeggio that we just had. The third track titled Take No Prisoners is a solid F sharp minor thrash track, which is gonna be three sharps in the key signature. So we're taking it from A major. The fourth track is called Five Magics and it's in the key of E minor and has a really neat bass line with flatted fifths and raised sevenths. So about half the song is instrumental and we hear a little bit of the low vocal there underneath Dave once again. Poison Was The Cure, going on to the next song, has more harmonic minor chord progressions in E minor, creating lots of tension before the vocals kick in. The sixth song, we're back in F sharp minor again. Towards the end, we hear a cool diminished run by Dave and Marty. You need to understand key signatures and the circle of fifths. Now, if we were in the key of C major, the easiest key, we have no sharps or flats. Go up a fifth, we're in G major. That's gonna have 
one sharp. I don't want you to worry about how to know what sharp it is just yet. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, up a fifth from G is D. That would mean that we go up another fifth, okay? Our next sharp. This is in the key of D major now. We need to get to A, which is another fifth above D, okay? And would you look at that? It's G sharp, a half step below our root A major, okay? And remember, if this is A major, it could also be considered F sharp minor, yada, yada, yada. Moving on. Now, seemingly going through this record, it was solid track after solid track. Now, we get to number seven, Tornado of Souls. I'm sure this is the big one that you're all looking forward to, and it's for good reason. Now, the song widely blew up out of all the tracks, and it's really considered one of the best metal songs in history, especially because of Marty's guitar solo. Now, the song is in the key of B minor. Now, B minor is the relative minor of D major, okay? So all I'd have to do is get rid of this. All you have to do to figure out what the sharps are is know that the first sharp starts on F sharp, and then from there you literally go up in fifths as well. So the keys you go up in fifths and the key signature you up in fifths. Do not get those two confused, but they do the same things with the formula. So if we're in the key of C major, go up a fifth. We're at G major. That's going to have an F sharp. Go up a fifth from G major. That's D major. That's going to have bring the F sharp over. Then you're going to have up a fifth from F sharp, which is C sharp. You literally have to just keep going up in fifths clockwise. So the song basically follows a one, five, six, four chord progression. And especially in the chorus and the guitar solo, it's basically being played over a B, G, E, F sharp, and then into an A natural and an A sharp, making it extra suspenseful. Now, since these were power chords, Marty's able to tease our ears while using an E minor to an E major arpeggio and the iconic arpeggios at the 34th measure following the chords underneath with the exception of the D diminished arpeggio at measure 38. Marty shows us a really good example of how to shred with still having iconic melodies and not sound too robotic. This guitar solo basically broke metal because of how awesome and melodic it was while still being really shreddy and really iconic and fast. For many, many years, people have covered this hundreds and hundreds of times, and it's a really good example of how having really strong melodies can really get your guitar solo to be as good as it can be. The eighth track on the album is titled Dawn Patrol, and it it is a transition song into Rest in Peace, Polaris. The song is the last on the record and basically is a groovy song from E minor to F sharp Locrian. And to summarize, Rust in Peace is the greatest combination of using really unique, dark, and fast chord progressions and riffs while also still keeping those pop elements. Overall, has some really good catchy hooks and really good melodies. Moving forward into 1992, Countdown to Extinction was Marty's second album run with the band, and he still had a few more to come. The first track is titled Skin O Mati. It's a reasonably simple classic metal sounding tune using the key of A minor, so no sharps or flats in the key signature. And the song follows a really easy to digest form and is a really solid start to the record. Now, the second song is titled Symphony of Destruction, and this is by far one of their biggest and most iconic riffs of all time. This is also really another good example of using the flat two or the F natural in the key of E minor. Now, this pre-chorus is argued to be in more of an E Phrygian, meaning a minor, okay? So if we are in a minor key, the Phrygian mode would not be the third mode. That would be in the major scale. So if we were in the key of C major, E minor would be Phrygian. But if we went to the minor, which is A minor, the relative minor of A minor, all we'd really have to do is go to the fifth scale degree, which is E. So basically E Phrygian. So starting on the fifth. So the chorus utilizes Dave's signature chromatic chord progressions, but still maintaining the key of E minor. And Dave uses a lot of tritones, raised thirds, and raised leading tones. And the song once again has some really solid melodies and hooks for mainstream listeners of hard rock and metal to digest. So what the heck is modal mixture? Because this is a really good example example of this. If we have a raised third, that's a really strange thing to do. So that would mean instead of doing a G natural, we would have to do a G sharp. Okay, now the main concept of modal mixture is going to the parallel key. Now the parallel key is not the relative key. Don't get that confused. From E minor, the parallel key would be E major. From C minor, the parallel key would be C major. So what we're doing is we're borrowing notes from the parallel key 
in order to spice up our chord progressions, our riffs, that sort of thing. Okay, a really good example of this is something I posted the other day about Barracuda. Basically, the vocals use somewhat of an E major scale while the riff is still an E minor. Really cool stuff. I'd highly recommend you give it a try when you're writing riffs. Architecture of Aggression is the third song in the album, and it has some of Megadeth's traditional stuff we've gotten over the years and it's in the key of F sharp minor, so three sharps in the key signature. But the next song is one to take a little bit of a closer look into. So the fourth track is titled Foreclosure of a Dream, and it's in the key of G minor. So G minor is the relative minor of B flat major, so we are in two flats in the key signature. Now, being that we're in the key of G minor, we need to have two flats, okay? So we need a B flat, and we need an E flat. Now flats are a little bit different than sharps when we're trying to figure out keys and key signatures. The main concept of this is that when we go to the right clockwise for the sharps, we do circle of fifths. But when we go to the left, we're gonna call it the circle of fourths. So all I want you to know, C major has no sharps or flats. I want you to know that if you go to the left one at 11 o'clock, F major has one flat and that is going to be B flat. You just have to memorize that, okay? It's going to take too long for me to explain to you why that is, okay? But it has to do with fourths, okay? But from there, we just go in fourths. So F major is our first one. Up a fourth from F is B flat, okay? Up a fourth from B flat is E flat. Okay, and what we're doing is we're right here with two flats in the key signature, but we have to go back three frets because we're starting a major going to minor, which is G minor is our key. Sweating Bullets is the fifth song on the album, basically using E minor with A flat to fifth once again, and Dave does a sort of monologue for the vocals. This Was My Life is the sixth song, also in E minor using more chromaticism and cool intervals like the augmented six and the raised seven. Count Into Extinction is the next song with one of the coolest bass lines I've heard from Megadeth. We're in A minor using the diatonic scale. The eighth track is titled High Speed Dirt, and we're back in our heavy sound at a 187 beats per minute. And we're in A minor once again, and we hear some seven sharp nine chords at the 95th measure as an F, A, D sharp, G, and that position is moved up chromatically. The ninth track, we have Psychotron, and we're back in E minor. We have some more flat two stuff, and it's a really solid track. The 10th track is titled Captive Honor. Really slows down to 92 beats per minute, and works around E minor with the flat two once again. The main riff after the intro used F sharp to F natural and then to the tonic, a really cool way of adding extra tension. Now the final song, we're back in E minor and we're using the flatted fifth, which is B flat. And it also has some really cool circus-like chromatic shred runs from Marty, which I always love hearing. And the song in general has some really standard Megadeth aspects with some angry and aggressive vocals. And in summary, this album felt like it kind of mellowed out from Rust in Peace, but still carried its own weight and definitely was a really solid album. And it had a lot of good chord extensions in a lot of these songs. And overall, it's a very solid experience. Megadeth's fifth studio album titled Youth in Asia seemed to have more mixed reviews of Dave's composition. And in some outlets, they were saying that they just weren't too happy with the direction compared to their previous two albums. But nonetheless, the numbers still proved to be very successful, and we'll talk about why that is. So the first track is starting to follow the trend of tuning a half step down, kind of like Guns N' Roses, so we're following that uh, late 80s track. So for Megadeth, this was definitely new. I also just put on the hat, because why not? Heavy bass, solid guitar fills, and good vocal hooks. I think that this song is very, very solid to start out with, because being an E-flat minor for the intro, but as we go, we kind of start to develop an A-flat minor routine. Second song is titled Train of Consequence, and we're using the same tuning in the key of E flat minor. The bass once again carries the song and I think the production is very appropriate for the style. And the section about 30 seconds in is in F minor, so four flats in the key signature. And a strange spot to modulate to, but it worked really well. And once again, the way I was able to tell that was the dominant chord, or C7. Now going on with more flats, if we're in the key of F minor, let's first go back to our major keys. We had F major, then we had B flat major, and then we had E flat major, okay? That would be a total of three flats. So we're gonna go in fourths, B flat to E flat, E flat to A flat. It's a little confusing, but remember, the keys in the key signature work the exact same with the rule of fourths or fifths, okay? So bear with me here while we figure out the fourth one. So A flat up a fourth is D flat. Okay, so this would be in the key of A flat 
major. But the first thing that you need to notice is that all you have to do to figure out the flats, if you see the key signature, go to that second to last flat and that is your key. That's a really good way of figuring things out, okay? So, so A flat is the fourth fret on the guitar. Go back three frets and then we are in the key of F minor. And there you have it. Now, the dominant chord would be what? Starting on the five, which would be C. So we'd basically play a C dominant seven chord. So C, E, G, and B flat. Okay. And how I kind of figured that out was E natural is not supposed to be in the key. It's supposed to be E flat, but I should make sure that it is E natural out of the simple fact that it's supposed to be E flat. So the next song is titled Addicted to Chaos. And now we are in the key of E flat minor once again. And them dyads are diatonic. And they throw in a nice tritone from C to F sharp. The fourth track is titled Tout le monde. And this song is once again a really slow burner, almost like a ballad in F minor. The key change from F minor to G minor at 2 minutes and 37 seconds worked pretty well just after the solo. And the key change doesn't last super long. Elysian Fields is the fifth song on the record, featuring a more driving tempo of 134 beats per minute in the key of E flat minor. So the style resembles the first few tracks on this record. The sixth song is titled The Killing Road and it's once again an E flat minor and the riff involves using E flat minor into E natural minor and then B major into B flat minor arpeggio in pitch. Chorus once again uses tritones and flat fifths and the seventh track is titled Blood of Heroes and it's in A flat minor keeping that moderate tempo after the acoustic intro. The next song is called Family Tree and once again the same key of E flat minor but nothing too different on this one. A simple one seven six seven chord progression. So real quick if you don't understand these Roman numerals first of all you should at least know Roman numerals one through seven they look like this but if you don't understand how to figure them out just go by the intervals. So if somebody says a three chord in the key of C major that would be the note E. Okay. Everything works with counting in music as in the root is one. Then from there, everything goes two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then the eighth goes back to one. So don't call it eight, call it one. So if we're in the key of C major, a fourth would be C D E F. Okay. So if somebody says to play a four chord in C major, you'd play an F major chord. But if you don't know the tonality of major versus minor, the easiest way to remember it is one, four, five is always going to be major in a major key and two, three, six is going to be minor. Seven is going to be diminished. Minor is going to be a little bit different, but it's almost the same thing. The song Euthanasia is the ninth song on the record, E flat minor with a blues-esque riff. Tenth track titled I Thought I Knew It All has some more chromatic chord progressions with the dominant chord and some more of the same stuff. Eleventh song is titled Black Curtains. The song uses a flat two and a raised seventh which next to it is a regular minor seventh in that key. Victory is the twelfth track consisting of mostly the same stuff with the exception to the flat five. Now the 13th track is another slower groove, more flat two, more chromaticism, and even more dialogue from Dave. I'm not gonna go much more into this song or this record for the sake of saving some time because the song is really short and with the same old Megadeth stuff, but this record was overall pretty good despite the fact that it was a little bit lighter and not as good as maybe the previous two, but I still had a good time. Cryptic Wings is the next album in 1997. This received mixed reviews and I really like the intro of this whole entire album because it has some really dark and spacious vibes. Now going into E minor, we have a 1647 and it really sounds like a nice chord progression with less tension and more hope. That's kind of what happens when you stop using the dominant chord and when you just start using the major seven chord. Almost Honest is the second song, also in E minor. Once again, the bass carries the song pretty strongly. We get some cool synths underneath and some really cool overtones. The song has a lot of hard rock elements and I think it's a pretty solid track, nothing overly complicated, just the right amount of focus and riffs. Third track uses the F sharp 11 chord, which is really strange, and a C major 13 chord, which I'd safely say they were just looking for some tension before resolving back to E. Mastermind, the fourth track, uses a flat five, more of a blues scale in this context, and has very classic rock-esque feels, and we get some more chromaticism in some sections, but overall is the same feel. Now the fifth track is a little bit faster, going up to 148 beats per minute, and the chord progression has a power chord of that flat seven and flat five. The sixth track, 
I'll Get Even is a pretty interesting sounding song with heavy synth and bass. Very 80s, definitely, no doubt about that. And it's kind of the same thing for the seventh song. Both are slower in the key of E minor and a little more experimental. Now the eighth track, we're back in G minor, so we're having two flats in the key signature. The song is titled A Secret Place. Now, it's really refreshing to hear this new key because all the other keys that we had, we were in the key of E minor and I'm sick and tired of E minor. The ninth song, Have Cool Will Travel, is a very Zeppelin sounding song and I was honestly shocked it wasn't a cover. I really thought it was a cover, but there's not really much to say about that one. And moving to number 10, which is called She Wolf. It's an E minor, 172 beats per minute and uses an E minor to a C minor chord progression. And I must say, this is the first time we're hearing a minor six chord in a Megadeth song, at least to my knowledge. So if you're not entirely sure of minor six chords in minor keys, because typically the six chord is a major key. So if we're in the key of E minor, it's supposed to be C major. So we're kind of going to C minor, which is pretty cool. So the 11th song is titled Vortex and it's in B minor. So more chromaticism in a power chord shapes in a standard Megadeth song. And it really came out to be a pretty decent song. The next song is titled FFF, and it's also in B minor, and the song is only 2 minutes and 47 seconds, one of their shortest songs to date. So it has a lot of punk influence, very fast, power chords, shouting, yada yada, moving on. In summary, this record has a lot of highs and lows in terms of their composition. I think that they definitely were expanding their sound in some more interesting concepts like the synthesizer, the weird chords and stuff, and they did have some solid traditional Megadeth stuff, but again, I think that they lost a little bit of their touch compositionally. Moving on. The next album is the final album to feature Marty Friedman. So this one is called Risk from 1999, and this album also got some pretty mixed reviews. So the first song is titled Insomnia in a minor filled with chromatic falls in around 30 seconds. We actually hear a pretty modern drop in the chorus, which is really nice to hear. The second song titled Prince of Darkness is once again a Dave monologue, and we have an E minor bass line and some other strange noises, some eerie undertones with the lead guitars and with the rhythm guitars. It does work pretty well, and this is the most streamed song off the album. The third song is called Enter the Arena, only 43 seconds of shouting crush, which in my opinion didn't really transition well into the next song. And then we basically keep exploring F minor with this bass line, and then we also end up going into A flat and then F sharp minor. Breadline is the fifth song, basically going back and forth of E major and E minor. And you can tell by the use of the G sharp in the first two measures versus the G natural in the next two, which is really awesome to hear. So this is another really good example of modal mixture as we stated previously. The Doctor is Calling is the sixth track on the record, having a really weird intro using a Metallica-like chord with a flatted fifth as we've been used to. The riff can be looked at as F sharp minor with simple diatonic notes aside from the C natural as it doesn't fall into the key. So one thing that I do have to talk about this song is the choice of vocals that Dave did in certain parts, okay? So one minute and 11 seconds in, Dave is basically singing the exact same notes as the power chords in the song are singing. And power chords are already doing parallel fifths and him on top of that kind of makes everything sound super straight and mono and narrow, okay? So this is why parallel fifths in music are seen as not the best thing to do, okay? There's some really good videos about why parallel fifths don't typically sound that good. ...of parallel fifths sounding like one voice is audible in the opening rift of Black Sabbath's Iron Man. As an inattentive listener might assume this to be just one powerful voice, when in fact it's a series of parallel fifths. <laughs> Now, don't get me wrong, in certain contexts, I love parallel fists. In rock and metal, parallel fists are great, but sometimes, especially when you're trying to be a little more articulate with your music, parallel fists might be something to avoid. So let me give you an example of what a parallel fifth is. So a fifth in music, going from the note C to G, that would be a fifth, C, D, E, F, G, right? The fifth of the scale. So I can write it like this. So right here, C to G, that would be a fifth. And then what I can do to make a parallel fifth is I would just literally go from D to A, okay? That is literally what a power chord is, and it's the most common parallel fifth in rock and metal. Doing parallel fifths is great in metal. If you have the vocals following exactly, exactly what the guitar is doing, especially with the root note, 
it kind of falls apart in the mix and it kind of also falls apart a lot in the compositional aspect okay it's because it makes things sound very mono it makes it sound like the vocals are really closed in and the vocals are the most important part about a song a lot of people tell you that it's the guitars I love guitars, I love riffs, but we got to have a good melody for people to keep listening to the song, okay? It's really hard to pull off something like this. It can work in small bits in certain contexts, but in this case, I just think for how long it was, it was something that probably should have been avoided. The next song is called I'll Be There. It's in D minor, it does the same thing we already talked about, changing the key from major to minor, as in D minor to D major. Wanderlust it has a cool bass line of A to B flat to C to B natural something we've kind of already heard. Chorus has a really cool classic rock sound. In D minor, we start with a seven chord, which is a little bit unusual. Now the ninth song is called Ecstasy. Once again, we're in D minor using a one, five, three, four. It's strange that the four is major, likely borrowed from the parallel key. The song follows this five for most of the song with some chromaticism towards the end. The tenth song is titled Seven. It's in E minor and sounds classic rock once again. And once again, I was shocked that this wasn't a cover. Time the beginning is the 11th song. We're in E minor with an A minor nine floating around a nice six to five is heard so the five to six chord progression is what we're going to call a deceptive cadence okay so i need to really quickly make sure that everybody understands the deceptive cadence and cadences in general so basically in music cadences are the end of a chapter as you can think of it or the end of a book as in it can be the end of a melodic phrase or idea or it can be the end of the entire song they're used all the time, okay? And the way we typically do a cadence is something like this. The five to the one is gonna be your most common cadence, okay? That would be what we would call a perfect cadence. We usually use the dominant seven, and then we resolve to the one. You can do this with the diminished too, as long as it has that major seven scale degree or the raised leading tone in the minor key, okay? Bear with me here for a second. I know that sounds very confusing. We have to create tension and then we have to resolve it at the end of our melody. Okay, let me explain that one more time. If you make a melody, you need some tension and then you need to resolve it. Okay, do you need to always? No, but this is usually how music is, at least in Western harmony. Okay, so if that's the case, why would we use a five to a six? Well, that would be called a deceptive cadence, okay? So hearing the five chord is going to make us want to hear the one. That's the foundation of tension is we want to hear it resolve back to our tonic. But if we go to the six, the six is going to sound a lot more like a deceptive type cadence. So there are other things like the half cadence, um, and there's a couple of other different kinds, but for now, deceptive cadence is the five to the six. Time the End is the final song off the record, and I think the intro is actually pretty clever on the vocals considering the riff has a sort of a major feel. Even though there's a G natural, the D sharp sounds more happy in this context rather than dark harmonic minor. Now the vocals are following the lead guitar, which works a lot better considering that the lead is playing a melody that is a lot darker. This album has a lot of fun aspects of major versus minor trading off, like parallel chord borrowing and some difficult to digest song forms, but it made for a pretty decent record. So the next album is from 2001 titled The World Needs a Hero, and this was the first and last record to have new guitarist Al Petrelli, and generally had some mixed reviews. Now, some noted it was the first record in a while that started to return to their roots, but let's find out if that's true. And keep in mind, this is also the final record with David Elfson until 2010 when he will come back. So the first track titled Disconnect is in the key of E minor, and the riff features a minor six and then a flatted fifth. Basically outlines a one, seven, six, five. Second track titled The World Needs a Hero is in A minor, and the bass is playing a blues scale in A minor. And we also hear some Locrian riffs on the guitar, meaning we start on the note B, but we play the A minor scale, so B, C, D, E, F, G, A. The third song, titled Moto Psycho, is in G minor, so two flats in the key signature. The song is pretty short, diatonic chords, six to four, and three, yada yada. The fourth song, titled 1000 Times Goodbye, E minor, using a flat two, descending chromatic line from G sharp to F natural. The song later on mellows away from the flat two and uses the F sharp more often almost to the point where it sounds like we're in F sharp minor. And the fifth track is called Burning Bridges. Once again, we're in E minor with B flat and fifth as in B flat, but in this case, we're more certainly trying to go for the flatted five chord. 
The song has tons of chromaticism and tritones in the chorus making it super dissonant. For example, in measure 38 we have the flatted fifth as well as the flat two, so nothing new here. So the guitar solo is super neoclassical, so we're mostly using the harmonic minor scale and the Phrygian dominant scale. So let's really quickly make sure we know what Phrygian dominant is. E harmonic minor, the notes in that would be E, F sharp, G, A, B, C, D sharp. Phrygian dominant, what we actually need to do is we need to start on the fifth scale degree because remember, Phrygian, right? Phrygian means that we are going to start on the fifth scale degree. Phrygian dominant, harmonic minor, raised leading tone, right? So we're gonna be basically starting on the note B right here. So I'm gonna 86 this, and then we're gonna do B, C, D sharp, E, F sharp, we're gonna do our G, we're gonna do our A, and then we're back up to our B all the way in the corner of the screen. So all you gotta know is Phrygian dominant start on that fifth scale degree. It's gonna sound a lot darker in harmonic minor. The sixth song titled Promises has some cool chords in the intro, but basically outlining in D minor, one to two, which is diminished into the diminished seven, and then the dominant seven chord. It is a solid modulation to G minor on one minute and 20 seconds, basically using B flat as our pivot chord into D7 to confirm the modulation. Number seven is titled Recipe for Hate, some E minor featuring plenty of dissonant modal mixture. So the eighth song is titled Losing My Senses, once again using the exact same modal mixture of the G sharp, also using the minor to major seven interval as we've seen. The ninth song is titled Dread and the Fugitive Mind and is more or less the same as what we've heard and a solid song with some good and much needed double bass in the middle. Silent Scorn, the 10th track, starts off with an E add 9 chord and then an add 13 and then an add sharp 13 and so on and so forth. And this is basically using the bass notes to change the overall tonality of the chord as we've already seen before. It's a really good composition technique to try out, so I highly recommend it. This song is more or less a transition song into the 11th track, titled Return to Hanger. The song is in E minor with a quirky offbeat rhythm in the intro, still 4-4, and once again, having more of the flatted fifth in the chord progression, yada yada. The final song is in E minor called When. It's 9 minutes and 14 seconds long. It has some ethereal chords like the A minor 9. Once again, more Dave dialogue and more bass note movement with tons and tons of dissonance. A good chunk of the song is much heavier and more or less a diatonic groove. To summarize this record, we had some more weird chords and interesting modal mixture and some better and heavier songwriting, making it a fairly decent record. The System Has Failed has another 12 tracks and Chris Poland returns on lead guitar as a session musician. And this record did much better and a lot of loyal fans really like this one. So Chris Poland, you must have done something right. So let's see what we got from a compositional standpoint. So the first track is titled Black Mill the Universe. It's in the key of E minor using 16th note triplets, the flat fifth in between the C sharp. We've seen Megadeth do this shift in E minor to F sharp many, many times already. And in this case, as the song goes, we do more or less of the same structure, but up a major second. The second song titled Die Dead Enough is in B minor, so two sharps in the key signature. Oh wait, more like E Dorian. The tricky part is he avoids playing the C natural or C sharp, so he's able to kind of dance between two keys. Kick the Chair is track number three. It's an F sharp minor with some straight chromaticism. The Scorpion is the fourth track using the flatted fifth once again in E minor and most of what we've already gone over. Tears in a Vial is the fifth track. It's an A minor using a really sick riff with some dominant diminished chords, diatonic in the harmonic minor scale. Six track, I Know Jack, is in 12-8, and we've already seen that a little bit earlier, and is a transition into the seventh track called Back in the Day, which is in D minor. Both songs have a very similar riff style, but just in different keys. The eighth song, titled Something That I'm Not, is in F sharp minor. It's a pretty straightforward diatonic song, and has some children of Bodum esque chromatic parts during the solo towards the end. Ninth song is titled Truth Be Told. It's in A minor, starts with pretty simplistic chord progression. Also, once again, we get the augmented sixth interval at the 34th measure, which is pretty cool. The 10th track, title of Mice and Men, starts off a cappella, F sharp minor. It's a really solid way to start the song, and it's really easy to digest, even with those weird vocal lines towards the end. The 11th song, titled Shadow of Death, is a transition song in D minor with some parts in E minor. Last song, titled My Kingdom, is in E minor and more of the same stuff, like the flat two and the flat five, the F sharp drone, and a wah solo. 
And overall, this album is a little more heavier, has some solid phrasing, easy to digest melodies, and I think the composition aspects were very, very solid and nothing too complex. Perfect blend of both. The next album is titled United Abominations. It's the first and last album with Glenn Drover, who was in King Diamond prior to Megadeth and the brother of the drummer, Sean Drover. The first track is titled Sleepwalker, starting in E minor. Time signature is 3-4, which is really nice to hear. And until the distorted guitars come in, we're more in 12-8, uh, which is 12 eighth notes per measure. The main riff features a regular flat five and also has their signature F-sharp drone, as we've already gone through. The second track is titled Washington is Next, using eighth notes with a more triplet feel on the leads. Rhythm guitar outlines some nice dyads, like the perfect fifth, the minor sixth, the minor second, between B and C, and until it resolves to the perfect fifth. So more stuff that we've already seen before. And it has a pretty rad soul using modal mixture at 156 and E Phrygian dominant. The third song is titled Never Walk Alone. A Call to Arms is in B minor using the same stuff like the flatted fifth and the chromatic chord progressions. The fourth song is titled United Abominations. It has a very blunt tritone between G and D flat. And the rest of the tune is staying in E minor using the flat two pretty consistently as we've already been very, very used to. The interlude has some more chromatic power chords and chord progressions. Fifth track titled Gears of War, again in E minor using the raised seventh, but the rhythm guitar is holding a B flat five chord rather than the dominant or diminished chord. The sixth song titled Bless Be the Dead, again in E minor and again using a lot of the same styles. The seventh track is titled Play for Blood, it has a really strange feel in the rhythm along with the standard 4-4 drums. Otherwise relatively same. And the eighth track was a redo with Christina Scabia from the Kluna Coil, which was really awesome. I was honestly really shocked to hear that they're using some new, more modern metal bands. Ninth track, an F-sharp minor, really standard diatonic natural minor chord progression. Tenth track is titled You're Dead. It's an E minor. It basically uses some symmetrical chromatic riffs on the fretboard. At measure 47, we temporarily are in 6-4 time, or 6 quarter notes per measure. This is the lowest stream track on the entire record. The 11th and final track is titled Burnt Ice. It's a groovy F-sharp minor lick with a hard rock feel with the switching of the lead guitars and the vocals. The chorus is pretty cool considering it uses drum chords as it's in E minor and A minor while the lead guitar does more chromatic lines with the wah. In summary, this album was pretty okay. I think it had a lot of skippable records, but it also had a lot of decent songs. I think that there were some quirky time signatures and a couple of decent spooky chords and things like that. But overall, not their best work. We're on Endgame now, the 12th studio album featuring Chris Broderick, which I'm really excited for. Now, Chris Broderick is a fantastic classical guitarist. He's very well trained in classical, a little bit of jazz too with Jack Panzer. He has a very long history in the world of metal and currently he is in In Flames and he is doing fantastic. And I'm really happy to see him doing so well, especially because he is probably my favorite Megadeth guitarist out of all of them. So. Definitely very underrated. I highly recommend you check out his other work. First song is Straight Instrumental, titled Dialectic Chaos. It's in E minor and then goes up another whole step into F sharp and then into G sharp. Really solid song with some great guitar solos exploring different temporary keys. This flows directly into This Day We Fight, the second song on the record. The main riff uses F sharp Locrian. It's obvious we're not in F sharp minor because of the C natural. This song has a total of six solos, which is pretty wild, and I have a feeling Dave wants some extra guitar parts to show off their new lineup. 44 minutes is the third song, and no, it is not 44 minutes long. It's in E minor. When the vocals kick in, we have more of that flat two, and the chorus has really easy solid melody with diatonic chords. Chris's first solo uses E Phrygian dominant. Dave's solo is using some weird chromatic lines and more of a Dorian sharp 11, which is the fourth mode of the harmonic minor scale. So same ordeal, take your harmonic minor, start on the fourth, end on the fourth. 1320 is the fourth song off the album. It's an A minor, more of the same stuff, F sharp drone licks, moving around in keys, like G sharp. Bite the Hand is the fifth track on the record, also in A minor, but once again starts off using more of the F sharp. Rest of the song, same ordeal. The sixth track is titled Bodies, back in E minor, as Dave loves and may as well throw in the flat two and the flat five while you're at it. Of course you did. Chris's solo is in A minor using more chromatic lines in the rhythm guitar, which is pretty rad. 
Endgame is the seventh song on the record using more F sharp, but it seems we're in the key of F sharp in general on this one, at least until about 136 where we're definitely in E minor. So obviously a common thing that we've been getting over the last little bit is these temporary key switches and things like that between E minor and F sharp. And the thing that you kind of got to look out for is the accidentals, okay? And you have to look for the tension chords and that's kind of what's going to give you a good indication okay and it seems like these guys kind of just like the positions on the neck of e minor and f sharp minor right and they just kind of right next to each other they have a lot of dissonance with that second and etc etc so the eighth song is titled the hardest part of letting go sealed with a kiss and it's in d minor day basically holds d minor with steady quarter notes while chris has a cool melody by going down a half step every other measure on his landing note, which is super duper dissonant, which was really, really awesome. The song has a lot of symphonic elements, also uses a lot more Megadeth traditional stuff. Flatted fifth, which at D minor is a A flat. Head Crusher, ninth track, really short and sweet, straight to the point, F sharp minor. Next is the 10th song, which would be How the Story Ends. And now we're in E minor, simple diatonic riff, good guitar harmonies. And the part around 2 minutes 13 seconds has a nice classical guitar melody, runs into the guitar solo with some good sweep taps and some solid tread runs. The 11th track, titled Right to Go Insane, is in G minor using the flatted 2, and the chorus is mostly diatonic as well and ends with a solid guitar solo with more fast guitar riffs. Overall, really, really solid albums, a lot of weak songs and a lot of strong songs. It was kind of in the middle for me. I thought it had a lot of really good signature Megadeth styles, and I thought that compositionally there were some really cool chords from Chris. Um, so overall, I'd say give it a listen. Not their best work, not their worst work. 13 is the 13th studio album from Megadeth, featuring some reworks of their older songs, and this record did very well, hitting number 11 on the US Billboard charts. Sudden Death is the first song on the record and the main chords are E minor to B flat as power chords, so more flat five stuff, and Dave shreds in E minor and diminished runs with a lot of simplistic tritones. The song has a lot of really neat sounding parts, like in the chorus is a one, six, seven diminish. The second song is titled Public Enemy Number One. The intro starts in D minor, but goes more into A minor with some really cool sounding intervals after the perfect fifth. We get a minor six from A and then an augmented sixth, the third track is titled Whose Life Is It Anyways? B minor, much more of a hard rock sound with using the flat two. The fourth track is titled We The People in using power chords of A, F, F sharp, and F again, basically the augmented six interval that we're used to. More of the song is diatonic with some more flat five and flat twos thrown in. Two minutes, 30 seconds, we temporarily use B minor, similarly how we temporarily use F sharp. Second scale degree of E minor in a lot of their previous songs. Guns, Drugs, and Money is the title of the fifth track. Really good example of all the stuff we've been talking about. So yeah, chromaticism, flat two, flat five, and E minor. You know the drill, Dave. Never Dead is the sixth track with a really solid, thick, juicy F minor riff. Riff sounds great with matching the bass. In fact, this is some of the fastest double bass I've heard from Megadeth so far, so shout out to Sean Drover for that. Moving forward, seventh track is titled New World Order in E minor. The song pretty much stays diatonic and has a couple cool time signatures like 9, 8, and then 7. Fast Lane is the next track, B minor and a flanger, because why not, right? It's early 2010s anyways. So this song drifts between E minor and B minor, and that has some really good heavy double bass, and that's not really that far off considering that they're only one sharp apart. Black Swan, the ninth song, the song is super straightforward in B minor, it's all diatonic basically, so nothing really that different on this one. Wrecker is the next track with the lowest stream numbers on the album. I'm not going to talk really a lot about this one, but one thing that I'd like to point out is this song, along with a lot of the music with Broderick, has that really upbeat and faster tempo, much less lighter stuff, which I think was a really smart choice to kind of start going back to what was very successful in the past. Millennium of the Blind is a rework from Euthanasia, so moving on. Track 12, E minor, flat 2, flat 5, or tritone. It's called Deadly Nightshade, a bass-heavy groovy song with some standard Dave lyrics, and I'm personally not a fan, a little too cliche for me. 13 is the final song, and we have E minor, and our first chord is E minor over C, E minor over C sharp, and E minor over G. So as you can see, we're using that compositional technique of moving the bass around, and the solo section has your favorite flat five and raised seventh. In summary, 13 has some pretty juicy riffs. It's got some really cool chords, got some pretty okay lyrics. I think that was a little weak there, but overall, I really like the driving force in a lot of the songs, and moving on. Super Collider is the 14th studio album by Megadeth. Last one with Chris Broderick on guitar, and Sean Drover on the drums. This album definitely didn't do too well compared to their last album, but we're gonna see why that is. 
Kingmaker is the first song on the record and it's in D minor, okay? So one flat in the key sig. I was pleasantly surprised with this one considering it was really fast paced and they didn't beat around the bush too much. Super diatonic, super normal, super solid song. Few dissonant notes in the chorus, mostly tritones. And yeah, we did go to that second scale degree temper in the solo once more, but otherwise, really good song. The second song is in G minor called Super Collider using some more easy to digest diatonic chords and some more vocal melodies. Another really solid song, so let's keep it going. Burn is the third song. Quick guitar solo before the D to D sharp lick, as we've heard some things from Dave before. Pre-chorus has a blues scale, and the chorus is super simple and diatonic. Fourth song in D minor, D standard tuning, which is something Dave doesn't really do often, so that was nice to see. Some basic chromaticism and overall angry sort of song. Off the Edge is in C minor, using a 1 and then a 1 add 9 and then a dominant chord, super melodic, and in the verse, we're going in more of a G feel at 220. We're now in E minor, some flat 5 action, with the guitar solo using freaking dominant once again. Dancing in the Rain is the 6th track, with really cool sounding G minor and G minor 13 chords, so we already know that the 13 is the same thing as adding a 6th up an octave in our chord. But that's most of the song, G to E flat, so the chorus we get G minor to F to E and to E flat. So towards the end we're in E minor, which honestly worked well and added a lot of aggression. Seventh track is titled Beginning of Sorrow, a really melodic slow burner in D minor. Sort of along the same old Megadeth stuff that we're used to. With the guitars exploring stuff in different keys and scales like G minor, E minor, and even C sharp. The eighth track, The Blackest Crow, uses a banjo in D minor, using a D minor arpeggio. And then changing up the bass notes from A to A flat to D. The violin underneath simply covers A to A flat and F to D. The vibe gets more heavier as the song goes, but it kind of keeps that same melodic folk sound. I actually really like this one. The ninth track, Forget to Remember, is in C minor, so three sharps in the key signature. Always nice to change up your key a little bit, huh? Listening to this song, as in the previous ones, honestly, I really enjoyed them, and so far I've disagreed with the criticism on this one. I think it's actually pretty good so far, so let's keep it up. Don't Turn Your Back is the tenth song, and it's more of a blues style in the beginning in D minor, some nice chill harmonies with a hard-hitting riff to get us more into that double bass. Nice chromaticism, sharp three stuff, raw solo, all that good stuff. And the final song is a Thin Lizzy cover, which is pretty cool. Overall, I actually really like this record. I think that the second half was actually a lot better than the first half, but overall, honestly, I liked it. So let's see how the next one goes. So the next album, we're at Dystopia. I can't believe we're already here, guys. And now we are in 2016. So this is their newest and latest guitarist, Kiko Loiro. Kiko is insanely good. He has so much versatility and so many different styles. I've never seen a guy this well-rounded and really good. So they picked like the perfect guitarist. I think he was in a power metal band called Angra, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, so they picked a really good choice for that one. And this album actually has really good reviews and was really successful. So let's see why that is. Already in track one, we're getting much more modern. Finally, some really good juicy mixes, pretty cool vocal lines in the intro. And then into G minor, we have a solid riff using the open string, as well as Phrygian dominant stuff from Dave. And you can already tell the composition is taking a huge new and more in-depth direction. So the verse holds D for a lot longer, letting Dave actually sing and get some solid melodies. This was a huge win for Megadeth, as Dave really focused more on the structure and getting right to the point. As I said, less is more. The song Dystopia is in C minor, using that moving bass line while still holding C as a drone, and now adding in a lead guitar. The verse is simply using the natural minor scale with a little bit of chromatic stuff at the end of the phrase. Around 1 minute 35 seconds, Dave does a really good job of changing keys to G minor, which is right next to C minor in the circle. Third track is titled Fatal Illusion, and we're in the key of E minor with some much chromaticism like the intro. And they take a bit to finally resolve to the verse, and these parts shift back and forth from E minor to D minor, not too far away once again. The fourth track is called Death From Within, more flat two stuff in D minor, so E flat. And the song didn't do super well for me, uh, at least with the hook or the melodies. Not horrible, but just not as good as the other three. But let's keep going. Bullet to the Brain, the intro does the Dave thing where he uses an E minor chord and moves the bass notes in weird ways, thus changing the overall tonality of the chord. The interlude in the middle is in G minor, but goes back in E Phrygian dominant for the solo. So we've seen tons of Phrygian dominant throughout their whole discography. Sixth song titled Post American World, a moderate tempo, D minor, chromaticism, closer to the root. Dave takes some really lower vocal melodies, five fifths and seconds in the chorus, 
Damn, that's a nice solo. Poisonous Shadow is next. In D minor, or rather Phrygian dominant, really cool sounding once again. Some thick double bass, overall really slow, but nice sounding melodies on the vocals. The end has a piano melody using D harmonic minor into the A song, which perhaps is one of their coolest intros. Conquer or Die has some really pretty classical guitar, as Kiko is classically trained as well. So in D minor, using D standard tuning, using some passing tones into the A flat, onto the 11th fret, and then the raised leading tone. Much more metal as we go, of course, and then more diatonic stuff, and into the ninth track we go. Lying in State, D minor, fast punchy, really drastic turn, simple open D string riff with an F to an E to an E flat, or to the flat two once again. The final track is titled The Emperor in G minor, more chromatic stuff. Honestly, in my opinion, this album is really, really good. It does a really great job of getting to the point and still keeping that same heavy sound while the mix is so much better. Really one of my favorite records from them. Wow, we are here, the final album, The Sick, The Dying, and The Dead. And this was released in 2022. I am really, really tired, but I am going to finish this damn thing. So this is actually the first one in a really long time to not have David Olufsen on the bass. So that last record, that was his last time on. So the first song is the same title as the album. And the style is definitely more modern with a retardando or just slowing down of the last arpeggios into the real fire of the song. So that's a really good example of something to do in a cadence, right? The first thing we need to know is we have a new key. Yes, we're in F minor now. So we only had a little bit of F minor. So it's really refreshing to hear that. The strangeness in the middle of the song is going to G minor was a little bit interesting, but we do get there back to F minor pretty quick. Life in Hell is the second track in D minor using that thrash offbeat style, and the main riff uses the flatted fifth, so A flat, but otherwise pretty normal. And with the tempo change in measure 91, going a lot slower. Third track features rapper Ice-T called Night Stalkers. Again, using the same drum style and doing some really good tension and resolution with your chromatic lines. And outside of the small appearance of Ice-T, the song doesn't really do much new. So let's keep going. So the fourth track is pretty cool. Sounds pretty cinematic in the beginning. It's an E minor, more classical guitar stuff. Using E as the drone with outlining different tones, some non-diatonic. And the song progresses as the heavy guitars kick in as we get some pretty strange chords like the one at 124, C sharp, which we can consider some more mixture. But the way Dave goes into D minor in the verse is pretty impressive, basically using E flat to D, and it was barely noticeable. Sacrifice is the fifth song using a lot of really weird key changes. The verse is using A Phrygian dominant. The pre-chorus is more E minor and the chorus is more B minor F. Keep in mind these are all sort of temporary and they get away with it because of all the constant chromaticism, so it's kind of difficult to find a key center here. The sixth track titled Junkie is in D minor, the flatted fifth, all that jazz, nothing new here. Let's keep going. Psychopathy is the seventh track and it's only a transition with a lot of bends and overtone sounds. Going into D minor, Killing Time is a cool example of reversing their typical flat two with introducing the major second before the minor second. And interestingly enough, the E chord at zero minutes and 50 seconds seems to act almost as a five of five chord. And it has some suspense that feels like it would resolve more to a minor. For the 10th song, we're back in G minor and the song overall has a really good hard rock style vibe. And at 152, we have more key changes like going to D minor. So if we were in the key of D minor, okay, with one flat right here, and then we wanted to eventually get into G minor with two flats in there, there's 50 bajillion ways we can do that. We want to use chords that are common tones. So for example, let's say we wanted to do, I don't know, we can do F major. That might not be a bad thing because F major would be the seven chord in G minor. We can use that. But I think one of the best ones that you could use is the B flat chord because that's something we've seen before with Megadeth. So basically a B flat major chord as in this would be considered a six chord. And then this same thing over here in G in G minor, this would be considered a three chord. Makes sense. The 11th song titled Mission to Mars is also in G minor using the one six four chord progression. And we do temporarily go into C minor in the pre-chorus, which isn't too far away. 
Anyways, the final track, titled We'll Be Back, is also in G minor, but it quickly falls to D minor in the verse when Dave comes in, for simply using close keys to modulate for different sections of the songs. The first solo is really crazy with slides, really showing how far this band has come with all the evolution of their guitar work, and it's a nice tempo change towards the end of the song, and using a D diminished chord, it's an overall awesome way to end the album. Well, if you have made it this far, I seriously applaud you if you watch the entire thing. Congratulations on that. If you've skipped around, that's totally okay too. I hope you guys found this really, really useful. I hope you guys learned a lot. I learned a ton here. I uh, did my best to explain all the music theory aspects that went along with all their songs. And I really did listen to their entire discography beginning to end. And I tried to point out some of the best things. So thank you so much for watching. I'm exhausted. I'll see you guys in the next video. Good night.